Hi everybody, TJ Mack, Vintage Cards and Nostalgia here. First of all, I want to remember Brooks Robinson. I've really enjoyed seeing the tributes both on various sports channels and by some in our card community. What is coincidental though is that I was originally planning on speaking about Robinson in this video before I became aware of his passing. I do have his uh, top base player run from 57 to 1977, and I'll show that another day when I want to do a little deeper dive into his career. But today I wanted to share my 57 tops rookie along with the 58 tops and his 1970 tops. Now I picked the 1970 tops because I think that's his most memorable season in the sense that that was the year the Orioles won the World Series and he just put on a spectacular defensive display where he robbed hits from several of the Reds batters on his way to the World Series MVP as Baltimore beat the Reds in five games. So I think that's really his standout um, moment in his career, basically. And I chose to show this 58 Tops card because this is what I was originally planning to do. Like many in this community, I think this is his least attractive card, or at least I thought that. However, a viewer, James Buck 6623, who saw my video profiling the 1958 Tops set, mentioned that the expression on Brooks' face is because he has a wad of chewing tobacco under his lower lip. And you can see the bulge right there. And I never noticed that before, but that actually impacts the expression on his face. The cameraman just caught him in the, at that angle as he's got uh, a mouthful of chaw under his lip there. And I think it changes my perspective on this photo now. I've always liked the soft tones of the card. I like the Orioles logo, the yellow stripe, and I just like how the color match is all nice. And he's got the warm-up shirt on underneath. I know some don't like that, but I, I like that because it's just what baseball was like back then. It captures a moment in time. And now that I understand that that's a picture of him chewing tobacco, it gives me just a whole new appreciation for the card. So now I like a lot more than I used to. So I just want to thank uh, James Buck, 6623, for bringing that up. Now the next player I want to talk about today is Tommy McDonald. He's a player I really enjoy collecting from the late 50s into the early 60s. And I talked a little bit about him in my 1961 Tops and Fleer football video. Now he came into the league as a running back from Oklahoma where he finished third in the Heisman Trophy voting in 1956. He never lost a game in college. He was part of that uh, Sooners run of undefeated games, and when he was there, they went 31-0. and When he was a rookie in the NFL, he was drafted in 1957. He was converted from running back to wide receiver during his rookie season, and he excelled at that position for many years, and he would eventually be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1998. Now, when he retired in 1968, he was sixth all-time in receptions, fourth all-time in receiving yards, and second all-time in receiving touchdowns. And he was just a, an outstanding player of his day. He was known mostly for the Eagles. As you can see, here's his rookie card, the 57 Tops. This is his second year 58 Tops card. He didn't have a card in 59, and then he had cards from uh, 1960 until 1968. He played, um, in addition to the Eagles, and you can see here in the Cowboys, he also played his last couple years with the Atlanta Falcons and the Cleveland Browns. But the reason why I wanted to talk about uh, Tommy McDonald today is not so much to highlight his career. What it really fascinates me about him is that I love the fact that he was five foot nine, 175 pounds, and was the last non-kicker in NFL history not to wear a face mask. Just a tough, tough guy. And he did not wear a face mask up until he retired in 1968. He would say face masks are for wusses. Now, it really pissed him off that the NFL passed what he called the Tommy McDonald rules, which required all NFL players to wear face masks in games. Now, in 1960, the NFL, and it was a little sketchy here, but they had at least a temporary rule where they required face masks because McDonald had to wear one for a short time. And he picked the smallest, most insignificant face mask that was allowed. So he went with a single bar face mask that the kickers wore. Now I know that didn't last for his entire career, as I said, because there is footage of him not wearing a face mask later on with other teams and also with the Eagles. What bothers me, though, is that he took so much pride in not wearing a face mask 
but his goal line art card that was made when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and I'll show a copy of it. It shows him with a single bar face mask, which he signed a lot of them because this, again, is a copy. This is not an original one. You can see he, he autographed many of them, and I'm surprised he did it, frankly. Maybe he wasn't aware that they were going to make a goal line art card with his face mask on because I know up until the time of his death, that was something that he was so proud of, the fact that he didn't wear a face mask when he played in the NFL so I really think the artist missed the mark on this by showing um, McDonald with the single bar mask on when he didn't want to wear one throughout his career. One of the interesting things I find about um, cards that I like to share in the history of the game, and I thought others might find it interesting as well. Now here's a newsstand issue from my father-in-law's magazine collection. This is the Sports All-Stars 1971 Baseball Edition, and... This may be the first mention of the big red machine on the covers. You can see it here. The big red machine will roll again. And I'm not sure if the big red machine has ever been shown up to this point on the cover of any other national magazine. I did a little research and I discovered that the big red machine was first actually used, and I saw this on Wikipedia, um, on July 4th, 1969 by Bob Herzl in the Cincinnati Enquirer but it gained prominence in reference to the 1970 Reds team, which won 70 of its first 100 games. And then, of course, we knew the Big Red Machine was around in the mid to late 70s, and that's really when I thought the name came in vogue, when they had George Foster, Ken Griffey, and Joe Morgan to go along with the three I'm showing here, of Pete Rose and Johnny Bench and uh, Tony Perez. So I learned something today about that when I discovered uh, that on the cover, about the Big Red Machine will roll again. And that's, again, what I love about magazines is that it gives you some insight to what was going on in the sports at that time. So always learning something new, and I just thought others might be interested in that as well. Here you can see often what would be um, shown in magazines in the 60s and 70s, advertisements for baseball cards. And you could buy the complete 1971 Topps baseball set for $14.95. They were also selling series one to six for two ninety five for each series, or you can get most cards for a nickel each. You want the nineteen seventy football set? That'll set you back three dollars and seventy five cents. Now there are so um, many old sports magazines, as I mentioned, that have these ads for cards, and even within this magazine, there were a couple other card ads in there, which I thought was really neat. Here's an ad for a Willie Mays baseball game for $3.59. Now the article on the Big Red Machine in the magazine was written in Pete Rose's voice. Whether he wrote it himself or not, who knows. Anyway, I have showed you earlier in this video three of the cards that I have from the 1970 top set depicting the Big Red Machine. Three Great looking cards. I love the 70 set, just like the conservative look of it with those gray borders and the white inset. Just a beautiful design, I think. And really the, the last of those classic uh, 1970 uh, and before designs before they got into a lot of the action photography. But anyway, uh, within this article, it talks, uh, Pete Rose really talks a lot about the hit on Ray Fossey, what I, which I found very interesting, and he was very defensive about it, which we've heard later on in his career, but this is a pretty fresh perspective on it. He said in the article that from six different angles, it showed that he did the right thing, and he said, anyone critical of, of him hitting Ray Fossey was a loser. I never try to hurt anybody, but I play to win. And he talked about having Ray Fossey and uh, Sam McDowell at his house the night before the game, which I've heard that in the past. And he said that Ray's a good guy and he'll be a fine ball player for Cleveland. And just an interesting little insight from that time that I just wanted to share with everybody today. Here's a closer view of the bench, Rose and Perez, in case you wanted to see it. The uh, last um, card I'm going to show today is a recent pickup. It's been a long time since I've added a Diamond Stars card. And here I have a beautiful 1936 Diamond Stars Frank Crescetti. And my buddy Rick Acosta and I were texting and I saw this Crescetti and put a bid on it. I wasn't 
necessarily looking for it at that moment, but I just kind of came across it as we were texting back and forth. And I won it for around $75, which is a great, great price for that card, and it's a beautiful example of it. And Rick seems to bring me a lot of good luck when it comes to getting vintage Yankee cards. I won my 1950 Bowman Rizzuto when I was texting him as well. Here's a shot of the back of the card, and you can see the 1936 copyright there, and it's also got the blue ink on the back. So the 36 copyright, of course, tells you that that's the year uh, that Diamond Stars issued it. And it's one of the higher numbers in the set. It's number 86. And usually a pretty tough card. It's, uh, it goes for a lot, typically a lot more than the $75 I paid for it. So I just got it really at the right time. Now, Crescetti was a very good fielding shortstop. He had a below average bat. He was known as the Crow. And he played from 1932 to 1948, all with the Yankees. Now, I'm not going to get into his life story, but as a player and a coach between 1932 and 1968, all with the New York Yankees. He won 17 World Championships and was part of 23 World Series. And that's more than any person, I believe, in baseball history. That's pretty remarkable and not something you hear very often. Now, this is a beautiful card. It's got a real stylized look to it that many of the Diamond Stars have. Now, I remember my friend Chris at Stories and Cardboard. He believed that maybe that's Lou Gehrig in the background. And I read in the Sabre Baseball blog uh, on the Diamond Star set that that could be Lou Gehrig and in the dugout maybe Babe Ruth. Unfortunately, we're far short on any hard evidence. It's probably just an artist's rendition of players to enhance the photo like many of the Diamond Stars are. But who knows? Maybe they drew a little inspiration from the Babe and the Iron Horse when they are putting this card together. Either way, I love the card. It's my 14th edition to my slowly growing Diamond Stars collection. So everybody, uh, until next time, I hope you all have a great weekend.